What effects does a turbocharger's bearing system have when run without oil for literally two to three seconds? Today, we're gonna delve into what we term a dry startup. Today, you are gonna learn something. Welcome back. Uh, here's another YouTube video for you. It's going to be a technical one. It's going to be a long one. So I'll try and keep it as layman as possible for those of you that don't grasp the technical terms or the technical uh, aspects of the turbocharger that well. But today is going to be an exciting one. What I want to do is delve into the bearing system. And when I say delve, I mean microscopically. We're actually going to take a microscope and have a look at a bearing system before it's run on a balancing machine uh, or even assembled and run on a rotating assembly inside of a bearing housing. Then we're gonna go down, run the rotating assembly without lubrication to simulate an engine idle and turbocharger rotational speed at an engine idle, disassemble the turbocharger, come back to the microscope and show you what it actually looks like when you run a bearing system without oil. There's gonna be some engineering going on. I'm gonna to go to the CNC lathe and I'm gonna start turning some parts. I'm gonna go and CNC machine a compressor housing for an upgrade that's a three minute cut cycle. And I'm going to show you the surface roughness under a microscope of the OEM Garrett finish, surface finish, which we'll term RZ and RA. I'll show you that on the board just now. We will go and do the actual machining and we'll come back and show you what our machining looks like uh, in terms of the surface finish compared to the OEM Garrett surface finish on a brand new turbocharger. I'm also going to explain to you why bearings fail when they are run without lubrication. And I think when you actually see what a bearing looks like, the surface at least, as well as the shaft surface under a microscope, I believe you're going to be very surprised. All right, guys, we're at the board. I'm going to just do a small drawing for you to show you what the metallurgical term RZ and RA means, and then I'm gonna show you actual pictures of the bearing surfaces thereafter. So what you're probably gonna look at and start seeing is something that looked like that. I'm gonna have a zero line across this graph, and I'm gonna have another little line. I'll explain what I'm drawing to you in a second. Right, so we have an arithmetic mean roughness value depicted in a picture on the board over here. That's the zero line. These are obviously positive uh, values, if you wish. These are negative values underneath the graph, if you wish. Now, this section that is colored in yellow is your, what we would term an RA, and the peaks over here we would term an RZ. Now, the RZ is essentially, if we keep it layman, I'm not gonna go into uh, too much detail here, but when you look, and you'll understand what I'm gonna talk to you about now, when I show you the actual microscopic zoom of the surface of a shiny back of a compressor wheel, for example, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about here. So once you machine any material, it doesn't matter what it is. It can be a ferrous or non-ferrous material, it can be bronze, st stainless, aluminum, whatever it might be. You will always have a surface finish. You will always have striations, grooves, cut marks from the tool you used on the machine, whether it be a lathe or a milling machine. And those, once you zoom in, that surface roughness will basically depict peaks and troughs. Now, when we speak about RZs, just for want of another, explanation, yes, it's not 100% correct, but think of the peaks. When we speak of the RAs, uh, think of the troughs. Okay, so any material that you machine will have a surface roughness. It's gonna be easier for me to explain as I zoom in on the microscope. But before we do that, I'm gonna actually show you a photo, or I'm gonna actually show you a compressor. Now this is the back of a compressor wheel which we manufacture. This is a billet compressor and it's machined from 6,000 grade aluminium and the surface roughness is well within specification of an OEM uh, blade and it looks pretty smooth. I'll give you a close up of this now.
So there you'll notice the surface of this compressor wheel is nice and shiny and it's obviously quite smooth. However, if I take my finger and I'll hold this compressor wheel close to the microphone and hopefully you'll pick it up, you'll actually hear a scratching noise as I run my fingernail up and down the base of the compressor wheel. Listen to this. Okay, so you can hear that scratching sound. So what you're hearing is my fingernail rubbing across peak to peak to peak of all of those machining striations. Although you can't see them, they are there. Let's go to the microscope and let me show you a closer look of that. Okay guys, so we're here in front of the, uh, the microscope. It's a, real ba it's a really basic microscope, it's nothing fancy. We're not gonna go to microstructure or macrostructure. We're gonna go to a, probably a, a 50 or a 60 times zoom, but with a proper focus. Now, what you're looking at on the screen over here is essentially this hole. I just wanna give you the orientation of what you're looking at on the screen. Yes, it's out of focus. I'll bring it into focus in a second. That's the hole uh, on the actual compressor wheel. There you'll see that edge over there is essentially where the radius begins and it moves across, keep your eye on the screen and it gets to the edge of the wheel over there. Yes, it's out of focus, I'll bring it in focus right now. Great, so I'm gonna move this onto the back disc where I was running my fingernail, which is more or less there, and I'm going to bring the microscope down. I'm gonna keep going, I'm gonna keep going. I wanna go, I wanna give you guys, there already you can see a very clear picture of the striations, the machining marks on the surface of that compressor wheel. Although it looks shiny to the eye, if you zoom in, you actually see what's really going on on the surface. Now I'm gonna go even further and then bring this back into focus for you and there you can see a clearer picture of all of those striations. Now the dark lines are your RAs or the troughs and the shiny lines are the peaks. Let's go a little bit more. And I think that gives you a better idea. Let's actually push it a bit more and see if we can get any closer than that. Yes, we can actually. So, I mean, that gives you a really, really nice view of the RZs and RAs. Now, if we go all the way back out again, and we hold this up to the camera, you can see that with the eye, once again, it's nice and shiny and it's smooth. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna show you something really, really interesting on bearings and shafts. Now let's first start off with a compressor housing. This is a compressor housing which is made by Garrett. This is an original housing. It is unmachined, unmodified. What we're gonna do is we'll go down to the CNC and I've written a program to cut this housing open. It's a three minute cycle, which we'll show you as it starts cutting, we'll just speed it up for, uh, you know, so you guys, we don't bore you guys with all the engineering. And then we'll come back up here and we're gonna compare the pictures that we're gonna see on the microscope. So let's actually put this on here. And what I wanna do just in front of the camera is I'm gonna go and zoom onto this flat section over here. And then I'm gonna go onto the radius profile to show you the different surface finish. So this is the flat section. Let's bring this down into focus. And what you're seeing is once again, RZ and RA. The troughs are the dark lines, the shiny bits are the peaks. Now let's move this across until we get to the radius profile. Have a look there. There's the transition between the flat section and the change of direction with the radius profile, where the radius profile comes into play. I'm gonna hold the housing up, it's quite difficult to do, and I'm just gonna bring this a little bit closer, try and get it back into zoom, into focus, and there you can see a clear transition between the surface, the flat section, and obviously where it transitions onto the radius. You will more than likely find that it is due to two things, one, the cutting tool, um, the radius, it's cutting on a different portion of, of the actual cutting tool's face. At the same time, if you're running a constant surface speed on a CNC, the speed will actually get faster and faster the closer you get to the zero point on your actual rotating uh, um, axis. What I wanna do next is get 
our little contender. This is a brand new Borg Warner BV39 rotating assembly. I'm going to disassemble this rotating assembly and I want to take the shaft out and I'm going to put the shaft under the microscope to show you what the surface finish looks like. Then we're going to take this guy downstairs and we're going to go and run with this little oil cap inside. We're going to run this rotating assembly on a balancing machine on the VSR at approximately 10 or 15, maybe 20,000 RPM, which would simulate approximately the rotational speed at an engine idle of this rotating assembly without oil. We're only going to do it for a few seconds. Then we're going to come back up here. We're going to disassemble the same rotating assembly again, and we're going to examine the shaft and see what we find. Let me take this apart and grab a cloth here. Knock the shaft out. Bearing jumped out as well. Let's put this bearing back in. Let's have a look at what we find under this little microscope. So I'm going to bring this down, bring it somewhat into something that we can actually recognize. Right, so there's the edge of the shaft, okay? What you're looking at there is the edge of the shaft, where it goes, it transitions from the bearing face onto the, where the compressor wheel would basically connect. Now I'm gonna zoom in, or come down, and try and get you a portion of where the bearing itself would run. Get you into focus here. Those little dots you're seeing there is lubrication. I've got a rag here with metal methylated spirits on. I'm just going to take this rag and wipe the shaft, bring this back again, just get you back right. That's the step. And approximately there, that's where I want to actually show you. Let's zoom in a little bit more. So there you can clearly see the surface of that shaft. As you can see, it doesn't have the same machining marks as what the compressor wheel does. There's a reason for that. Because these shafts are ground. They are not cut with cutting tools. To get the final size, which is quite a precision controlled size, on your turbine shaft, you need to actually grind that. So that gets done on a cylindrical grinder. That's why you can see that the striations you see on the shaft are completely different to what you've seen on the back of the compressor wheel. Now, let's just check the bearing quickly. The bearing that decided to jump out at us out of the same core assembly. Let's have a look at this bearing. Remember, this is a fully floating bearing system. So the bearing turns inside the bearing housing and the shaft turns inside of the bearing itself. Right, so. Let's just go back up so you guys can get an idea of what we're looking at. There's the bearing, just to give you some, some reference, okay. Whoops, I've just moved everything. Let's just come back down here. And whoops, it rolls away again. Let's just put a nut in front of it. Sorry guys, I just want to try and get this set up. Okay. Now let's go and zoom Go right down to the surface. Now you can clearly see the bearing shiny. I mean, it's, it's, it's got a beautiful smooth finish and your bronze type materials always, they're lovely to machine. They machine very nicely. But what you're not seeing is, look at that surface. Can you see, I'll even zoom in a little bit more. Have a look at the striations on the surface of that bearing. They're not smooth, by no means. So, the shaft has got a surface finish, or a surface roughness, and the bearing's got a surface roughness. The same surface roughness you will find on the inside of the bearing as well, where the shaft runs. I'm gonna try and angle this so that we can actually come down and see if we can get a clear picture. You can see that's the edge. 
Can you see those striations? So the bearing on the inside is quite rough if you compare it to the shaft. Okay guys, so what I'm gonna do now is just show you, bring into perspective what I've just shown you on the microscope. On the bearing, how the bearing is manufactured is it is held in a lathe and there's a cutting tool which will machine the outside face, which is this outside face here. And at the same time, there will be another tool which machines with a cutting tool, which machines the inside face, the hole on the inside. Now, obviously the bearing is rotating and the cutting tool is moving across the face of the bearing. What is the, what is the cutting tool actually doing? It's cutting a thread just like a thread you'd find on a shaft or a screw or a bolt or any type of fastener. It's actually cut a microscopic thread into the surface of the bearing. Now, if the bearing was a nut and it rotated on a shaft, it would move up or down the shaft depending on the rotation, the direction of rotation relative to the thread that has just been cut into the surface of the bearing. Because the bearing stays stationary and has circlips and other components holding it in one position, as that turns, you've got a thread, a cutting surface essentially, rotating on top of a shaft. Yes, it's got a specification, and yes, it's inside a specification, but the lubrication prevents the two materials from making contact. You will not have the shaft actually making contact with the inside diameter of the bearing because there's a film of oil between them. That's what lubrication is. That's the definition of lubrication, preventing metal to metal contact. Remove that lubrication. In the absence of lubrication, you will find the following. This is the surface on the outside of the bearing. And on the inside, you'll have the same type of thread. Now your shaft that sits inside of this doesn't have the same striations. It's ground, but it still has a roughness. So the shaft might look like this. And then you'll have, I'm gonna use yellow, lubrication between these two surfaces. Now that's what prevents these two materials from actually making contact with one another. Remove that lubrication and you will find that you've got a soft material, brass or bronze type bearing, running against a hardened steel shaft. Now one of the two materials has got a thread cut into it, onto its surface, as that rotates at in this specific case, 120,000 RPM, what do you think actually happens? Because the bearing doesn't move up or down in the direction of its thread, it actually is forced to remain stagnant and those thread profiles will actually run up against the shaft. It will generate a huge amount of friction which will basically melt away those peaks, those RZs of the actual bearing material and it becomes molten. As that becomes molten, it actually goes and fills in the gaps on the shaft surface. And that is what we term material transfer, otherwise known as a heat seizure. And it's visible by what I will show you in a few minutes. Okay guys, so we've clocked up this, uh, this housing, as you can see by the, the clock gauge. That's uh, pretty much as close as damn it, I'm happy with that. Let's get this machine set up and we're going to do some cutting. Right, I've just got to write a program here real quick. So that I can just find my datums. This we do manually, I just want to program this into the machine. Okay, we're going to load a program. Oh, cool. Load. Auto. Go. Right, here we go. So, this is 
the first cut. So this is basically a hybrid upgrade that we do on the V8 Land Cruisers. There are videos on my web on my uh, YouTube channel that shows you this, um, the entire process. And uh, I'm just doing this without coolant at the moment, just so I can show you what actually happens. Okay hey guys, so this is the final cut. This you will actually notice is uh, slightly faster. The rotational speed will be slightly faster. The feed rate will be slightly slower. Just get you some, something you can actually see. And uh, then after this, we'll go back up to the microscope and we're gonna have a look at the surface roughness so you guys can get an idea of what our machining looks like in comparison to the OEM surface finish. Great stuff guys. That's a job well done. Let's get this guy out of here. We'll show you a nice close up on the camera and uh, you guys will get an idea of what that job looks like. Hey guys, so this is the machined, upgraded compressor housing. Um, and let's just have a look at those striations. They seem to be a little bit finer than what Garrett's were. That's the radius profile. We're coming up to the rest of the radius over there. Let's just get this into focus. So, I mean, those are the striations there. That little transition over there goes to where the flat surface is. And uh, I'd say that that's actually finer than what the original machining from Garrett is. Well, there's a saying that we use, and this comes from Steve Clark from uh, No Sweat Racing. Better than that, not even in Japan. Okay guys, so we're in the workshop now and I've loaded a, that CHRA, for the Borg Warner BD39 CHRA onto the VSR. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run this guy without oil. You'll see there's gonna be no oil connections connected to the rotating assembly. I'm gonna do a run to 20,000 RPM. That's about as low as we can probably measure. Um, and I'll run it about two or three times. So the total run time at that speed while well, accelerating from standstill to that speed and back down to standstill again will probably be around about three or four seconds. Now, if you start an engine and you let it idle after you've just installed a turbocharger on, you're gonna basically, either, either if it's been repaired or, or replaced, you're gonna basically stand around, check temperatures, look for leaks and do your basic checks. That's probably gonna allow that engine to idle for at least 30 to 40 seconds, maybe even a minute, maybe a minute and a half, depending on if you find a problem or not. Sometimes guys start the engine, they let the engine run, gets up to temperature, climb in and they go and do a test drive. Now, 
in a dry startup application where you haven't primed the turbo. And when I say prime turbo, it's for another video, but I'll give you a basic intro as to what priming a turbo actually means, is it does not mean take an oil can and squirt oil into the rotating assembly. It's a completely different set of instructions and procedures entirely. So we'll run this turbocharger three or four times to so about 20,000 RPM. At engine idle, the size rotating assembly idles at approximately, probably between 10, 15, maybe 18,000 RPM, depending on how, how high the idle, the engine idle RPM is on the engine. So I've got this set to 20,000 RPM, and you can see the turbine name is Let's Kill a Turbo, because that's basically what we're gonna do here today. And here is the rotating assembly on the machine. Okay guys, so here's the rotating assembly, it's mounted on the VSR, here's the oil feed line, it's not connected. Here is the cap that closes the oil feed. There is no oil in here. I will remove the little plastic cap that blocks the oil return. There is no oil inside this rotating assembly at all. So I'm just gonna make a little reference mark on one of the blades. I'm gonna turn it to 12 o'clock and I'm just gonna magnetize the shaft, which is what this specific machine uses to pick up RPM and I'm gonna basically pull the shroud across, lock it, close up, and we are now going to do a run. I'm not sure how long it's gonna take or how many times I will be able to run this turbocharger before it starts to fail and whine and uh, create some sort of audible noise, but let's see what happens. Here's the first one. Okay, that's 20,000 20, RPM, 0.43 of a second. Now, that's hardly long enough to uh, simulate an engine idle. So what I'm gonna do is, I'll do that about five or six times, but I'm actually going to let the rotating assembly run, and I'm gonna quickly open up the cabinet and remove the shroud so that you can actually see that it is rotating. It didn't sound like it is, but it actually did. It definitely is. So I'm gonna say start again. As you can see, it's rotating and it comes to a stop. So that gets to, it's 20,000 RPM in, once again, uh, well, it doesn't really show me much because I stopped it halfway, but let's run it again. Last time we ran it, it was 0.45 of a second. So this is the area that you basically want to concentrate on here. We're not doing a balance. We don't care about the actual state of balance. Um, you can clearly see we've, set, we've indicated 20,000 RPM and that is the time that it's run at that speed. Well, from standstill to that speed. Okay, I can actually start hearing a bit of a whine. 0.42 of a second. Let's run this again. Point four three of a second. So we've run this about five times at half a second every time. So it's about two and a half seconds of run time. Let's go a couple more times. Point four three. Not sure why I picked up three point four three over there. Probably total run time. That run was 0.45. Okay, I think that's gonna be about enough for us to see a visible mark or some form of material transfer on the shaft and bearings. Okay, so have a look at the gap between the edge of the blade and the small aluminum insert behind the blade. Look at that clearance there. That is what we call radial clearance, up and down. Axial is across the axle. It's quite excessive, it's quite a bit. Not too happy about that, but it indicates that there's some, some wear. This is more than likely as close as damn it to the side of the actual radius profile of the turbine, of the compressor housing, um, because there's been bearing wear. Let's run it one or two more times at half a second uh, or 0.4 of a second and uh, then we'll go upstairs, disassemble this, inspect the surfaces under the microscope and we can go from there. Okay, here we go guys. All 
Oh, it's 0.43 of a second. Go one more time. Okay, so we've basically run this, I'd estimate, what, 10, 12 times? I mean, that's five, maybe six seconds of total run time, but that's not at 20,000 RPM. Remember, it comes to a, sta a standstill and then has to accelerate from standstill back up to that speed. Let's go and uh, remove this now, take it upstairs, disassemble this rotating assembly, and let's see what we find. Okay, guys, so we've just got back upstairs. I'm going to take this core assembly, I'm going to open it up and let's see what we've got inside. Okay, comp wheel, shaft, there's the bearings, oh hello, this bearing seems to have either seized itself onto the shaft or created a burr somehow. I can't get this, this bearing off here. Really, really interesting. Um, let me just use something that's a little bit more, more solid to tap this against. The shaft is, is, is destroyed. Um, let me just get something harder. You guys are gonna laugh now, but be that as it may, nothing wrong with a bit of fun. Uh, I don't have any other way to do this, not upstairs, and I don't feel like running all the way downstairs again, so let's just tap this shaft. I, now the bearings, I can't get this bearing off. Oh, greatness. Um, I can see there's a little bit of a burr or something on the edge of that shaft over there. Um, it's really, really weird because that shouldn't be there. Let me just keep trying and... <laughs> Man, I cannot get this bearing off. Leave the compressor side, uh, sorry, the turbine side bearing on. Let's go and take this compressor side bearing, which doesn't want to go back on again, um, and go and have, have a look at it under the microscope. If you look at the screen over here, I'll bring it into focus. There is a shaft, and let's have a look at the edge of the shaft. Can you see there's a thermal discoloration at the tip there? Let's zoom in a little bit more. It looks like a bit of a burr and thermal discoloration. That's probably why the, shaft, the uh, bearing wasn't able to come off. More importantly, let's have a look at the running face. Let's zoom a little bit closer. And let's have a look at what we will term. Let's just go even more. That there is a thermal discoloration. As you can see by the, I'm trying to get it into a nice position so you can see the bluing. It's, it's a straw to blue discoloration. Indicates 400 degrees Celsius on a steel type material. As I rotate this, you'll actually see that that's where the bearing was running. Now, let's try and get even closer, if we possibly can. Gives us a a better idea of the thermal discoloration. This is on the compressor side bearing. What I want to show you now is the outside of that compressor wheel bearing. So the actual surface of that bearing. Let's see if we can get it into picture. Right, there's the bearing. We're getting it into, into view. You can see a slight score mark. And I'm just moving it around.
around to see. There's not a lot of uh, damage or scoring on the surface on the outside. However, there you can see a bit of a score mark over there. What's really interesting to me is the turbine side bearing, which I'm going to show you first, and then I'll show you the shaft. So let's zoom out a little bit so you guys can get some form of orientation of where we are. There's the hole on the bearing, just next to the hole where the bearing runs on the, against the bearing housing inside diameter or the inside face of the bearing housing. Have a look at that. So what you're looking at there is thermal discoloration, but also that is what you'll see when the bronze material starts to melt and becomes, becomes in a molten state and those striations, those machining mark striations fold over and flatten out. So this bearing got so hot running against the inside of the bearing housing that those machining striations, those lines, the RZs and the RAs melted and fell over. They actually flattened out. That is indicative of high thermal operation. Let's try and see if we can't see the inside of this bearing, the inside diameter of this bearing. So I'm just going to bring this up again, give me an opportunity to try and turn the bearing at an angle. Right, what are we looking at? There we go. That's the face I'm looking for. Let's get some light onto the subject if we can. Difficult to hold such a small bearing in your hand and angle it at the same time. Okay, here we are. That's the chamfer on the side of the bearing. Wow, this is really difficult. Sorry guys, I'm not able to get a clear picture of that, but gives you a bit of an idea. Actually focusing, there we are. Give you a little bit of a, an idea next to that hole, what the inside face and the scoring you can actually see. This is gonna be what we're looking at now. All right, here we go guys. So this is what we term material transfer. That's the steel shaft right next to where the piston ring is, where my finger is. I've just taken the ring out, the air oil separator, sorry, not the piston ring. Have a look at the bronze material that has impregnated itself into the surface of the shaft. Then you see how that, how that has melted its way onto the surface of the shaft. Really, really interesting. And you'll see that that section over there looks like two pieces of hair or whatever it is over there, but the little globule there. So what actually happens is the bearing surface will reach its thermal ceiling, it'll become molten, it swipes or welds itself onto the shaft and it builds up in the direction of rotation. And as it builds up, it wears away the inside of the bearing, it continues to rotate, wears, continues to rotate, wears, builds up, wears, builds up, wears. Eventually there's sufficient clearance axially and radially for the blades on either side to touch the end housings. Let's move to the thrust bearing. That's going to be an interesting uh, find. Okay guys, so I'm just going to take this, this bearing housing apart, take this insert out and uh, Let's have a look at the thrust assembly. I'd like to see what the thrust is going to look like. I think the thrust bearing is going to display, specifically the thrust collar, is going to display a, uh, a nice surprise. So bearing housing is not really relevant here at the moment or for the moment. Let's have a look at 
the thrust assembly. Let me first of all assemble this just in a basic form so that you can understand how this goes together. So you have the thrust bearing, which is this bronze bearing over here. You have one of the collars on the one side and the other steel collar on the other side. You have thrust pads, which are those little hexagonal, or should I say little pads, I'm going to point to it with, these, with this Allen key. Those little raised sections over there are the thrust pads, there, 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 and there, and there. And they basically mate up against this face over here on the one side and that face over there on the other side. Let's have a look at this under the microscope. This is the one side of the thrust bearing. This is not anything that's embedded, it's not dirt. It is a discoloration and wear between the steel collar and the thrust bearing pads. This is on the one side and that is on the other side. You can actually see that it's gouged a groove, it's scored a groove into the outer circumference of the thrust pads. Now what I want to find, what I'm going to show you that's really interesting is, let's zoom in here get closer so we can see what it looks like on the surface. Look at that discoloration. Look at that scoring, you can actually see there's a groove worn into the material there. And there you can see some striations. Now, where do you think those striations come from? Let's analyze this for a second. I'm gonna take this off the microscope, we'll just move it to the side. And I'm gonna put the thrust collar on here. I'd like to show you the thrust face of this collar. Can you see those striations? They look like thread. And as you can see, there's discoloration toward the outside. And as we turn it, you can actually see that there is material transfer. Now, that same thread in inverted commas I'll bring this bearing back into view. Just do that, just get this guy back into focus again. That thread that's machined on the face of that thrust uh, collar, the steel collar, has machined itself in inverted commas or, or, or swapped itself. It's worn itself into the face of the thrust pad. Now, you're going to tell me, but hold on a second, that's not possible because that thrust bearing's face should be machined as well. And I'm going to show you that it's not the case. So I'm going to take a Garrett, a genuine Garrett TA45 repair kit. I'm going to take the thrust bearing out of that and I'm going to put this onto the microscope so you guys can see what the thrust face looks like. So let me just go right up so you guys can get an idea of what I'm talking about, yeah? Okay, so this little hole over there is the hole on the thrust face. One of the pads. Let's zoom in onto the surface of that pad to give you an idea of whether or not there's any machining striations on it or not. You can see there's no machining striations. This specific method is ground. That's the oil hole on the second fa thrust face. There's the third one as I'm turning this around. So it's not machined. I'm going to turn this over. You'll see other grooves. That's the oil groove. There's one of the pads, the thrust pads. 
There's the other one. No machining marks, no striations. The same thing goes for the thrust bearing that we were analyzing. So what you're seeing over there are the striations worn into the face of that thrust pad from the thrust collar, the steel collar. Really interesting, let's keep going. That section of the thrust pad over here, past those striations, appear to be untouched. And they are, and I'll tell you why. There you go, striations again, and then they wear away. Striations again, and they disappear again. Let me explain why. I know it's a long one and it's a tedious one, but there's a lot of information I'd like to share with you guys that's really, really relevant. And here's the last little piece before we're gonna close off, I'll come in for a landing. Now, on your thrust face, on your thrust pad over here, should I say your thrust bearings face, you've got pads. Now, these are essentially the load in the compressor and or turbine direction, axially, gets distributed across the, f the, the, the face of the thrust bearing on those pads. Now, remember something, you need to have oil to lubricate and prevent metal-to-metal -metal contact between the steel collar and the thrust pads. Now, how this happens is obviously because you've got oil from the engine being pumped via an oil feed line into the bearing housing, and then it's got little channels inside that obviously distribute the oil to all of the relevant surfaces. But if you've got two flat surfaces, how do you get oil between them? Well, you can't. So this is why a thrust pad on a thrust bearing is angled. Now, they're angled opposite to one another on both sides of the face, and here's an interesting uh, point for you, an interesting fact for you. So the thrust pad, if you're looking at the bearing horizontally, not, not to, toward the, the actual face, but toward the side, the pad itself stands up like this. And your thrust collar, your steel collar, sits like so. This is so that, this is to allow lubrication to enter into or between the thrust pad and the thrust collar. Now, how this happens is by the rotation, the direction of rotation. The thrust bearing with this little hole in it over here remains still. The thrust collar turns on top of the thrust bearing pads. Now, in this specific application, the thrust collar would need to be turning in this direction so that the oil can swipe and ramp up between the two surfaces. On the opposite side, it will be opposite. Now, this is why. Right. If you're looking at the compressor wheel from the front, and that is the direction of rotation, okay, clockwise, I'm going to continue turning this clockwise, and I'm just going to, I'm going to flip it around. I'm still turning it clockwise. Okay? What direction am I turning it when the turbine side faces you? Anti-clockwise. Okay, I'm still turning it the same direction, and when the compressor wheel faces you, it's clockwise again. So from the one side of the thrust bearing, you have pads raised in the one direction, and on the other side, you have them raised in the opposite direction, specifically, specifically to allow oil to ramp up between the two surfaces and provide lubrication, prevent metal-to-metal -metal contact. So that's pretty much a thrust bearing and how the pads are orientated and work with relation to the mating thrust collar and obviously lubrication. All right, guys, so I hope that's been informative. Um, it's a long video, as I said, it's quite technical. I try to keep it as layman as possible, but just to recap, Starving a rotating assembly that turns at a high speed of lubrication will kill it, and it will kill it quickly. If you have what we term in the turbocharger business a dry startup, which means the turbocharger runs without lubrication during an engine startup after it's been repaired and reinstalled or replaced and reinstalled, it will damage the bearings. This specific rotating assembly still turns. The specific rotating assembly doesn't make a noise. 
The specific rotating assembly has not touched the end housings. It's not leaking oil. It's not audible. So would you run it? You've installed it on the vehicle. You started the engine. You are unaware that it has been starved of lubrication for the first two seconds, three seconds, five seconds, however long. And it's not audible. It's not smoking. Of course, you're going to drive the car. The turbocharger fails. And what is the, uh, the obvious assumption? And we all know what the definition of assumptions are. The obvious assumption is warranty, 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 alarm bells are ringing. You take it back to, for example, ourselves. We disassemble the turbocharger and we tell you that you have starved the turbocharger of oil and you go, oh please, we've been installing turbos for 35 years. We've been a mechanic qualified with a red seal for 45 years, etc., etc." We get this on a daily basis, guys. Oil starvation during startup, a dry startup, even though the turbocharger seems fine, doesn't have excessive play, doesn't touch the end housings, doesn't make a noise, isn't smoking, you will always assume the turbo's in good condition because you can't see inside of it. Once the bearing system has started to take deformation through metal to metal contact, it's over. Even if the lubrication recovers thereafter, it is still over. You have got very, very high spots. The surface roughness is outside of spec, which will allow, because of the tiny little high spots, contact to be made between metal and metal or bearing and steel shaft or whichever mating surfaces are there. And that will progressively wear, because of the high speed of the turbocharger, in a very, sp a very short space of time. And eventually you will generate sufficient clearance for the end the, the wheels to make contact with the end housing. It will fail catastrophically. The next video I'm going to do for you guys is to show you how to prime a turbocharger correctly so that you never ever find yourself in a position where you've, you've experienced a dry startup. Well, that's the end of this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope it's shed some light on the subject. We've killed a turbo or a rotating assembly anyway. Well, I, uh, I've enjoyed it. I hope you guys have too. Like, subscribe, comment down below. Let's hear what you guys have to say. Catch you next time.